All right, I think we're just about situated to get started here. Um, well, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, uh, Secretary Vonk, wherever you guys are sitting. Um, today I'd like to spend some time talking about deer management and research across the state. And, and you know, we have staff across the state that are collecting a lot of, a lot of uh, survey and research data. And so what I'd like to do today is, is go over what, uh, um, what type of surveys we do and research and some of the results we've seen this last year. Um, and then talk about some other things we consider when we make our recommendations. And ultimately, I want to go over our recommendations and, and, and why we made those. I always like to start off with a little bit of history for, for those uh, uh, members of the commission that, that may be new to this presentation or, or uh, members of the public. Um, you know, we have two species of deer in South Dakota, white-tailed deer and mule deer. They're both native to the state. Uh, they were considered abundant uh, pre-European settlement. Uh, then with the Homestead Act in the 1800s that encouraged a lot of European settlement, uh, resulted in a lot of, a lot of market hunting and unregulated harvest. And, and uh, those combinations, uh, we, we began to see a lot of deer disappear in the late 1800s, both east and west of the river, um, as well as a, a lot of our other big game species. This is uh, pretty much the case for all big game species with that unregulated harvest and market hunting. Um, in the early 1900s, uh, we passed a law that prohibited deer hunting completely, except in the Black Hills. And then about 25 years later or so, um, deer recovered. We had deer in about uh, most of our management units across the state. So in 1951, we reopened deer hunting to a three-day season. And the next year, we went uh, across the river and opened it up West River. And since then, we've been having regulated deer harvest in the state of South Dakota up to this point. Um, I'm going to dive right into some of our population surveys that we do um, and start off with our herd composition surveys. Um, we do herd composition surveys to get an estimate of recruitment. We do this for, um, for all of our big game species. This is an important part of, of how a population grows and what we can allow for harvest. Our uh, herd composition surveys for deer occur in September and October. Um, these are random ground counts, and we get our age and our sex ratios from these data. Last year, we classified about uh, a little over 8,000 white-tailed deer and about 1,300 mule deer. So we got some pretty good counts. And this is what the data look like. It's um, not going to go over all the numbers. Hopefully you can see them, but just going to draw your attention to a few things here. Here's our fawn to doe ratios. This is our estimate of, of fall recruitment. That's fawns per 100 does. You can see we have some geographic regions broke out here and then looking at Prairie, Western East River, and Black Hills. So looking at our uh, fawn to doe ratios, just to grab a couple of them here, uh, for white-tailed deer now, last year we, had, uh, we saw 59 fawns per 100 does. Uh, in East River we were at 93, so we saw a lot better uh, fall recruitment in East River last year in our white-tailed deer population. Then the Black Hills, which is traditionally lower than um, then our prairie units, we were at uh, 72 fawns per 100 does. Now for mule deer, um, we don't have quite as good a sample sizes, obviously not the population, um, but let's look at the, the bottom number here statewide. For mule deer last year, we were at about 56 fawns per 100 does. Um, looking statewide at all, all of our units, we have 86 fawns per 100 does for white-tailed deer. And then um, we also collect some some buck to doe ratios um, gives us an idea of, of herd composition and this is important for our, our data population uh, analysis we need to have an idea of uh, what percent of the herd is bucks and does um, it's a it's a tough tough figure to get at um, but this is one way we estimate that um, you know we know there's different observability or we feel there's different observability in our bucks versus our does um, so this is probably a conservative estimate but last year we were at about 32 bucks per 100 does for both species. So talking about our age ratios, what's it look like over time here? Uh, again, this is an estimate of fall recruitment. It's not annual recruitment. We know we still lose some in the wintertime, um, but this does give us some trend data to, um, to review and analyze. Um, we have had some changes in survey methodology, in particular east of the river, that might influence some of these trends. Um, but the bottom line is we're seeing some consistent trends, um, not just east river, but also west river. Um, it's, it's probably real trends that we're seeing, and they are concerning in our populations. So um, let's look at a couple trends here. So we're looking at whitetails, uh, the blue line here. 
Um, West River, we've seen a pretty pretty substantial trend to we're, uh, we're at a record low this year um, for our white-tailed deer West River of, of less than 60 fawns per 100 does. Again, for East River, we've seen that consistent downward trend. Um, since both of them have uh, consistent downward trends, it does uh, lend itself to uh, um, some concerns from us from a population modeling standpoint. Uh, it is something we have to account for when we try and predict what we're going to have in the population for sure. Mule deer, a similar trend. Um, you know, again, here the last uh, five or so years, we've seen a downward trend in our mule deer recruitment. Um, of course, this is looking at West River. Mule deer for, uh, are from the Black Hills have traditionally been a little bit lower recruitment. Um, we also see that in our whitetails as well, um, but not, not as consistent of a downward trend, which is good. Another survey we do um, is an aerial survey for deer. This is not something we do statewide. It's, um, we do it in a few units. To, um, we use it for our modeling purposes. It, bring, it allows us to have a little more precision in our model estimates if we have an actual point estimate, and we can project from, from there. Now, we, we can't feasibly um, give them the staff and money to do aerial surveys every year in all of our units, but um, we do have um, some techniques that we can do some aerial surveys, in particular east of the river on white-tailed deer. Um, we are, there is a feasible way of doing that. Um, we've been doing studies on this from, from 2009 to 2013. Um, we've done some, own, some of our own studies in-house. Um, we've also had some work done through SDSU. Um, through some grad projects looking at sightability models development for white-tailed deer in eastern South Dakota. Um, we've developed four different uh, significant aerial models that we can use to estimate uh, deer populations in, in South Dakota. Um, two, two of those models were winter models and two of those models uh, were, were uh, spring models. Now in the winter time we have a much higher um, detection probability when we have 100% snow cover, so they are better models, they are better estimates, so we're, so we're sticking with the winter models. Um, we have a model for white-tailed deer and we have a model for, for mule deer. Um, the white-tailed deer model is out of Clark County and, and we feel like we can use that and have a tap similar to Clark County. And then the Fort Pier uh, National Grasslands is where we developed that mule deer model. And that was in really open habitat, and, and it, we think it's applicable for counting mule deer in open habitat, but the problem is is a lot of our mule deer are more rugged um, habitat where it's more difficult to count them, and um, we've shown through our research that you just can't count animals very reliably in those types of habitats. So we've got some more discussion and figuring out to do if we want to count mule deer from the air and do that consistently. But for white-tailed deer, we picked four study areas here, or four units this last year to do some whitetail counts um, using the Clark model. So what we did is we actually um, used the aerial survey model or the aerial, aerial survey estimates, sorry, and we compared that with our harvest model, um, which is a population model that we use within the department. So here the aerial survey model is in blue. These are the four different units. Um, so here's our estimates in blue last year that we had. And then comparison with just our model estimates using some harvest data and survival data that comes from Clark County. Now all these areas um, are, are relatively close to Clark County, either directly adjacent to it or within a couple of counties. Um, so we have some good data here to compare. Um, the bottom line is these estimates are not statistically um, different. So um, we, we're, we're pretty optimistic that uh, if we have good survival data and good harvest data, um, we can do some good modeling as well. So there'll be more work on that here in the future. Um, now I want to get into harvest. Our harvest data set is, is by and large our, our largest data set that we have to look at. We get a lot of good information from, from our deer harvest data. Um, first, let's real quickly talk about some of our deer seasons. We have quite a few seasons out there. We have a firearm season, um, which I've broken up here into West River, East River deer, and Black Hills deer. Within that uh, West River, East River, we have um, some different uh, uh, parts of those seasons, we have landowners on your own land, they're eligible to get a license. Uh, we have some free antlerless licenses that we'll talk about here a little bit later. And then we have the special buck season. Um, we also have archery seasons, muzzleloader seasons, we have youth and mentored seasons, we have seasons on the National Wildlife Refuge. And the bottom line is we have a lot of opportunity out there for, for hunters for deer hunting. In fact, if you just add up the applicants, which uh, we did here in 2013, we had 110,000 successful deer applicants. 
and we add up all of our other big game species combined, we had about 9,000 successful applicants. So kind of puts in perspective how important deer are to our, our hunters in the state, and we're providing a lot of opportunity, even when our populations um, are, are down from when they used to be here a few years ago. So what did we harvest last year? Um, last year we harvested about 56,000 deer. That's down substantially from our uh, approximate 71,000 deer we harvested in 2012. Um, you can see the breakdown here on white-tailed deer and, and mule deer. The bulk of our harvest is, is white-tailed deer at 49,000. Um, you can see mule deer at 7,000. We're usually around that 10 to 15 percent of our harvest is mule deer. A lot less mule deer in the, in the state than there are white-tails. Um, overall, when you add up all the days that hunters, deer hunters uh, spent in the field, you know, we had over, over half a million recreation days. Um, so it's a pretty significant source of recreation. And um, if you look at individual hunters, of course, a lot of hunters hunt multiple seasons or they get multiple licenses. Um, but um, if you look at unique hunters, the number of individual deer hunters we had last year participate, we were just over 71,000 deer hunters. So what's it look like looking back at um, where we're sitting from where, we, where we've come from? As you can see here in 2013, there's our total harvest, the top, top line. Um, this dates all the way back to 1975, and you kind of see the highs and the lows. Important, one of the important things I want to talk about here is, you know, beginning in the early 2000s, we started breaking record harvests. You know, we, we hadn't uh, topped 70,000 uh, statewide deer harvested, you know, um, ever since we began our records back uh, consistently in the 70s. And we broke records for, for a lot of years here until here the last couple of years, um, we've brought it back down to where um, we, we were in the past. So that's pretty significant. We had a lot of harvest. Another thing I want to point out is, you know, here's our white tail harvest. Like I talked about, our mule deer harvest is only about 10 to 15 percent of our total harvest. You can see the oscillations here. We just never really come up very much here on, on our mule deer population. And that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about here and um, moving forward in the years to come as we develop a deer management plan is, is you know, most of our deer we manage um, based on social carrying, carrying capacities more than biological carrying capacities. So are there some things that we can do to try and, try and increase the, the, the mule deer population and ultimately the harvest opportunities we have in the state? So something we're going to um, dive into and take a look at. So breaking it up by species, just looking back to 2000, you can see here we peaked in our white-tail harvest in 2010. Um, this is uh, by buck and does, does here in blue. You know, we're trying to get on top of the population here in the early 2000s, um, which makes sense. We want to shoot more antlerless deer to control the population. And now that we're backing off on harvest, um, that, that antlerless deer harvest is dropping as it should. Um, the same type of trend with mule deer. You know, we peaked in 2009. And, and again, our doe harvest um, did come up a little bit above our buck harvest, but thankfully now we're, we're down, uh, down to um, shooting less antlerless deer. I want to talk, just go over a couple maps here. We have, um, there's a, a million ways to look at our harvest data because we have a lot of data to look at, but there's a couple, a couple neat ways um, you can look at it. And you can look at it first, let's concentrate on this upper map. This is looking at total harvest for mule deer, counting all of our seasons. So everything, youth, archery, muzzleloader, firearm, what have you. And so this is a cumulative har harvest, and this is just by unit. So you can see those units where we, we have some pretty heavy mule deer harvest, relatively speaking. Um, here's, here's the legend. Um, but then you can break it down into harvest density, which shows you some pretty similar trend. You know, obviously the all of our harvest is west of the river for the most part. Um, but when you look at harvest density, it does pull out a few areas. Um, some of our limited access unit areas, when you look at a um, mule deer harvest per unit area, um, they're, they're, they're up there. Um, same with uh, you know, a few of these units that, that didn't pull out up there. So it's a different way of looking at the data set. We'll do the same thing for white-tailed deer. A um, little bit different here, you know, uh, the bulk of our harvest comes in the eastern part of the state for white-tailed deer. When you're talking high deer densities, um, the, the south central part of the state has been competing for that for a few years here. You can see we have some pretty heavy um, harvest numbers, um, but also, you know, the Black Hills here in western South Dakota really stands out. That's a, that's a pretty high harvest area. And even when you look at density, the Black Hills compared to all of the other uh, western South Dakota state or or a management unit, sorry. You know, the Black Hills really stands out, so it's uh, kind of neat to look at there. Uh, a couple more here. Um, we look at uh, 
hunter success. Um, we also look at tag success. And I'll talk about the differences in those um, more um, specifically here in a minute. But this is just looking at hunter success, the percent of hunters that are successful in, in harvesting an animal. And, um, you know, a couple things really, really um, um, uh, come, come out here when you look at it in this type of a, a map. You know, the southeast part of the st state, we had a really low hunter success. And then, and, and of course, we have really low deer populations in a lot of our units, and we really backed off on licenses. But you can kind of see that entire trend in the eastern part of the state that uh, our hunter success definitely stands out as being lower than the rest of the state. Another thing we look at when we're, when we're talking about making recommendations for license numbers and types is we look at firearm hunter density. Um, we do have good estimates of that. And of course, we have more dense populations in general um, in the eastern part of the state and south central and some of these uh, north central. But then the Black Hills here stands out too. Um, we, we do put quite a few hunters in the Black Hills because we do have uh, a fair amount of deer, um, relatively speaking, compared to the surrounding units. So just to highlight a few of our seasons in particular, this is looking at just our West River firearm season in 2013. We harvested about 17,000 animals, which was down from the 22,000 we had a, a few years or, or last year. Um, we peaked out in 2009 at about 35,000, so we're significantly lower than that. Our tag success, which is the percentages of tags that resulted in a, in a harvested deer, um, was 36%, which is a record low. It was 49% last year. We've never seen that low of tag success. Um, you look at hunter success, now there's a difference between tag success and hunter success. As a hunter, I may have a license that has three tags, and, and um, if, if I end up harvesting one deer, um, I'm a successful hunter, but um, I'd only be successful for looking at tag success in only one of those instances. So um, how many hunters were successful? 55%. It's a little better figure to look at in some situations and comparisons. Um, survey comments, you know, a lot of people take the time to comment on, on their harvest surveys, and we appreciate that. And, and a lot of folks commented about 1,300 last year. And, and we try to summarize that and, and make some sense of it and look for, for general trends or things that are sticking out. And, and one thing that really stuck out is about half the folks were complaining uh, about low deer numbers. And so we're, um, we're taking that to heart here. Um, East River deer, um, about 19,000 harvested last year, um, down substantially from the year before. And, and we peaked at 43,000 in 2005, a little earlier than we did West River deer. Um, but yeah, you can see we're, we're well, well below half of that right now. Uh, tag success, again, was really low, 38%. Um, again, that's a record. Um, should be telling us something. I mean, look at hunter success. It's, it's a little better, 45%, but still, that's, that's pretty low hunter success when you look at uh, a firearm season on the prairie. And again, we looked at comments. About 1,700 people commented. And um, it's, a, it's a little harder to interpret. Uh, about 25% of those were about less deer, and another 20% uh, were about um, uh, negative comments about our season extension, but they were relative to deer numbers. They had, you had not enough deer for season extension, so they were kind of a combination there. But again, about half of the folks in general complaining about low deer numbers. So moving on to the Black Hills, uh, success was a lot better than the Black Hills. Um, Tag success and hunter success equal, they're the same thing in the Black Hills because we only have single tag licenses. Um, but we were at 64%, so we're pretty happy to see that. You can see uh, um, this is success over the years from the 70s. It's pretty hard to see here. But here's our, our uh, hunter success over the years. So we've had an upward trend here. We'll talk about some of the potential reasons for that. But, but we're, we're pretty happy with, with the success. Um, we harvested about 2,300 deer very similar to last year um, with our firearm hunters um, but when we look at total harvest we had a um, we need to add in the harvest from those other seasons that are um, statewide seasons uh, and, and those folks that are allowed to also harvest a deer in the black hills and when you do that you need to add in about another thousand deer is our estimate so total harvest in the black hills was about 3200 deer and you can see the breakup of harvest from some of those additional seasons and one thing I do want to talk about or point out here is in 1996, you can see here, these are license numbers. Um, we're talking about buck or any deer type of licenses. Um, licenses used to be unlimited in the hills for, for bucks. And in 1996, we went from unlimited licenses to a, a limited quota. I think we were around 6,000. So you can see the definite drop in the license numbers there and, and our harvest did go down a little bit too there. 
Um, but uh, subsequently, we have seen some, some better harvest success rates there too, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, real briefly, just to point out some of the data, this is our Black Hills firearm season uh, data table here, looking back the last 10 years. Um, you can see here, I want to point out, you know, we, we were offering, you know, over 8,000 firearm licenses here back not too long ago. We're all the way down to 3,000 now. Um, that's that's by, by design. Um, those are limited licenses, and, and we want to restrict that harvest so that we can grow that deer population in the hills. And, and hopefully these uh, higher success rates are, are partially an indication of that, and hopefully we're heading in the right direction. I want to point one other thing out here, too. Um, our mule deer harvest, um, you can see here for, for bucks, um, we had a substantial drop from 2006 to 2007. Um, now that's when we went from, uh, um, we used to have pretty much a, an any deer or any buck type of license, and, or, and we switched from um, going from that, all, all of our licenses, we, we, we limited to a very few number of any deer licenses, and, and we added a whole bunch of any white-tailed deer type of licenses, so we're um, trying to... Uh, uh, protect some of those mule deer from harvest. So how do we do? Um, this is looking particular at that uh, rifle harvest and our unregulated season harvest um, from 2003 on. Um, you can see here when we had uh, uh, unlimited number of, uh, or not unlimited, but when we had uh, a whole bunch of any deer type of licenses, this was our mule deer harvest from our firearm hunters. Um, when we went to rest restricting those to a very few limited number of of any deer licenses, we definitely restricted and, and controlled the harvest from those firearm hunters. Um, and, and we've pretty much been um, doing that from, from that point on, and we have dropped the licenses a little bit in number. Now you can see um, the red bar, red bars here, this is our unregulated harvest on mule deer in the hills. In, in 2005, we went from unrestricted type of, or we went from unit to unit management on our archery muzzle loader. Um, and, and youth antlerless seasons, we went from unrestricted harvest, um, we went from, uh, sorry, unit by unit harvest to statewide license type of harvest. So these units are now statewide. We saw an increase in participation in those, in those seasons, which is what we wanted. And we also saw an increase in harvest in the Black Hills because it is a popular place to hunt deer. And so this is, this is the trend of that harvest by those unregulated seasons. So we were harvesting quite a few mule deer with those seasons. Now looking at does in particular, which, which is really what we want to control the harvest on if we're going to conserve mule deer in the Black Hills. You can again see 2005, we made that change in those unregulated seasons. We really got on the mule deer doe harvest there for a while um, to the point, you know, we were harvesting up to 400 mule deer um, does with that unregulated season. You can see our rifle harvest was, was pretty minimal in that time. So um, we, we were hitting the mule deer doe population pretty good there. Um, so since then, we have been um, implementing restrictions on those seasons to, to pull off that harvest, and, and, and we've, we've accomplished that. We've uh, restricted most of the mule deer doe harvest, so we're hoping that um, um, we can recover from this fairly quickly. But as far as our regulated harvest, we have controlled most of that on our mule deer does in the Black Hills. So moving on to archery. Um, Here's what our, our trend data looked like, archery going back to, to 1975. Again, in 2005, we made a change in our archery season. Saw an increase in harvest, an increase in licenses here, these uh, black boxes. And um, really, the, you know, a, a point to make on this graph is we've never seen this much archery hunting participation. So um, this, is a, this is a new, new management thing for us to consider as we manage deer populations across the state. Um, we definitely like to see the participation, but it is something we have to consider as we try and manage our deer populations. Uh, last year, our harvest success for archery was about 25%. Uh, not bad, pretty comparable to the year before. We harvested about 7,300 deer in that season. And this is what the distribution of harvest looks like for our archery hunters. Um, last year, this is just looking at uh, mule deer bucks and whitetail buck densities. You can kind of see some of those areas um, where archery, archery hunters are, are targeting for mule deer bucks. Of course, some of our limited access areas point, um, you know, sh come to light there. Black Hills is a pretty important spot for our archery uh, mule deer buck harvest. Um, um, but all in all, it's a relatively low number if you look at this scale and compare it with our, our whitetail buck scale, which is a lot different. Um, but you can see, again, the bulk of our whitetail density is, is, 
east of the river, but the Black Hills and some of those surrounding units do, do show up too as well. Moving on to muzzleloader, again, we're, we're seeing record participation in our, our muzzleloader uh, season, um, which, which again we've seen since we went to those statewide seasons and, and high deer populations, so it's uh, something else we have to consider as well. Last year, uh, success was about 20%, a little lower than the year before, which is close to 30%. And uh, muzzleloader hunters harvested about 1,300 deer. And here's what the distribution of, of that harvest looked like in 2013. Um, again, it's kind of interesting to see some of those areas that, that come, come to come out there. Um, the Black Hills, again, is an important destination for, for those unrestricted hunters, not only for mule deer, but for also for white-tailed deer. Um, but there are some of these other units that really stand out or folks are, are uh, enjoying or participating in, in harvest. And then youth, uh, um, again, I don't sound like a broken record here, but you know, we're, we're again seeing some uh, um, participation levels that we've, we've never seen in the past, and, and that's a good thing, uh, um, but it's something we need to consider in our management. Um, last year, uh, youth uh, hunting success was, was, was 45%, and they harvested about 2,500 deer. Um, we also have mentored seasons. We started about uh, four or five years ago. Uh, mentored harvest was about 1,400 deer and about 48% success. So looking at all of our total harvest, um, how does that break down? Um, you can see here, West River deer is about 30% of our total statewide harvest. East River deer is a little bit more. We add up all of our unrestricted statewide seasons. That'd be youth, muzzleloader, archery, um, some of those landowner owned land licenses. Um, we're at about, about a third of our harvest comes from those, those seasons. I wanna talk a little bit uh, um, briefly about some of the research that we're doing. Um, well, all of our research is management driven and we do this research so that we can better manage the populations and answer some of the questions we have as managers. I'm not going to read all this for you, but we do have a, um, a research project going on right now. It's looking at our fall herd composition surveys, those ones where we get our, our buck and our doe, um, our doe ratios from and, and our, our fall recruitment ratios. We're, we're doing a research right now to look look further into some of those, uh, those surveys that we do and, and try to narrow down some of our estimates and, and, and increase the precision of those estimates. And so we're looking at some different, different methods on those. Um, in particular, uh, we're looking at differences between months, what type of sample size we need, differences between daylight, spotlight counts, those types of things. Uh, another study we're also doing, this is uh, um, um, just like the one above, this is through SDSU, uh, Dr. Jinks, um, and the same grad student, uh, Chris Cudmore, is working on it. Um, Chris is actually a resource biologist for us, but he's doing his, his master's project here. Um, but he's looking at a, also trying to estimate the, the population size of deer in the Black Hills, and um, this is no small task, um, but a, he's uh, coming up with a unique approach, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll have some information that's... Uh, pertinent if not for population estimate, but hopefully uh, at a minimum for some, for, for some good trend data. But ultimately he's looking at um, some type of distance sampling from, from our roads in the Black Hills, and we have a lot of roads in the Black Hills, so, so hopefully he's uh, got some good opportunities there. Another research project that we're gonna be starting here this summer is looking at some deer modeling. Um, we're going to be de developing a database that's going to pull together all of our deer data, and, and we're going to um, tie that in with a with a, a program R, which is a statistical program, and we're going to use that for for better modeling our deer populations, and not only trying to come up with estimates of our deer populations, um, but also projections. So we're looking forward to to uh, uh, further refining some of our our ways of estimating populations there, and that's through uh, University of Montana with Dr. Lucas. And then we got another uh, project through SDSU with Dr. Jinx. It's a cooperative project with North Dakota, looking at white-tailed deer. Um, for us, for South Dakota, we're looking at white-tailed deer uh, up in Perkins County. North Dakota's looking at a couple counties up there, and, and they're looking at some of the impacts of energy development. South Dakota's kind of a control. We don't have much energy development in Perkins County, so we're kind of the control. It's a unique opportunity for us to gather some data on our white-tailed deer populations west of the river because we don't really have any good data west of the river. So um, this is going to be a great opportunity to look at some of those vital rates on our, our deer up in the uh, western part of the state. One of the objectives that uh, I, I uh, just, uh, of one of the projects I just went over, um, this deer modeling project, one of the objectives we have in that project is to, to, is to look at um, developing 
Dear DAUs, and a DAU is a data analysis unit. And um, so when we're completed with this project, we're, we're going to have some data analysis units for, for trying to analyze some of our deer. And, and we, we've done this already. It's, it's very preliminary. Um, these lines are going to change. At the end of the research, I, I anticipate some, um, some, some better defined lines. But, but just to talk a little bit about this, because we do a little bit of it already, um, we use these data analysis units for, for, for better, basically, uh, uh, better ways to gather our data, organize it, and analyze it. For example, you may have, um, you know, sample sizes in each one of these little little units that that aren't aren't by themselves um, large enough to really make a much much for inferences off of. But when you combine all those samples for this large of an area, you have a good statistical estimate, and you have some really good data that you can make some some predictions off of or use for management. So that's that's the idea behind these these DAUs and, and these DAUs, we need deer in this area to have some similar population demographics, some similar vital rates, so that it makes sense to um, say all these deer have a similar recruitment or similar survival. So we'll be looking at things like winter, winter severity, and we'll be looking at some of our survival data. We'll be looking at habitat types. We'll be looking at harvest rates, a whole bunch of data to try and um, um, you know, come up with a biologically sound way to define some of these, these bigger um, groups for our deer deer analysis units. So um, I'll, be talk, I'll be referencing those here a little bit uh, later on in this presentation, so it gives you a little bit of background on, on what those are. Um, continuing on with some of our other deer research, we are monitoring some, um, some adult does out there in-house um, done by our regional and terrestrial staff. Um, for white-tailed deer, we're monitoring doe survival in McCook and Clark counties. Um, Clark County, we've been doing for quite a few years now. This is an extenuation of a um, graduate project that Kevin Roebling was doing um, in the earlier years over there in Clark County. But in McCook County, we just, uh, um, as some of you may have seen from some of the press releases and, and press we've been getting on it, we just uh, captured uh, 50 does over there in McCook County to start some monitoring efforts there. So looking forward to gathering some data on a deer in the southeast. But uh, looking at Clark County, some um, summary data here on the survival we've seen. We have, Oops, we got some real interesting data. Um, average survival is about 74% for adult does, which, which isn't bad, um, not a whole lot. Um, that's pretty consistent with some, some other studies, but one of the important things to look at is, is we have some big variation between some of these years. You know, so, some years we were low at 67%, and in other years, this last year, we had really good survival, up to 81%. So important to, to, to realize that survival isn't the same every year, and we need to continue to try and, and, and keep it. Um, you know, keep, a, keep tabs on what, what we're seeing for survival out there. Now looking at mule deer, we also have a couple areas that we're continuing to monitor for mule deer. Um, we've just completed uh, two studies on, on mule deer, um, one in the Fort Pierre National Grasslands and then one in, in Mead Pennington was one study with two study areas. Um, we still have some animals left, we're going to monitor those to so continue to get survival weights, but you can see again um, some, some differences in survival between study areas. We averaged a little over 70% here, a little over 80% in, in Mead Pen. Um, so again, um, not only do we have differences between years, we got differences between study areas and species. So um, we need to do our best to try and keep tabs on, on what we have for, for survival out there. Because uh, this is critical in trying to estimate populations and trying to, trying to monitor where we're going for deer. Another study we just started here this last year was looking at, at uh, some survival data on fawns. Um, this is a, a study we were looking at four different study areas across the state. Uh, Kevin Roebling, well, our big game biologist at Rapid City, is, is leading this project. And we had a really great first year. Um, we caught nearly um, 170 fawns uh, across those four study areas. So it was a, it was a great first year. We're going to repeat that here in about a month. I'm um, looking forward to um, having some uh, data, um, annual variation, looking over the years in these study areas. And uh, looking forward to seeing what those those data those data tell us. Um, now we're not quite through a first year yet. Um, I'm hoping that after we get through a first year, um, we can do some thorough data analysis. Um, um, we'll have that underneath our belt. Maybe we can get Kevin to come back here and talk about some more details of those study. Um, but right now, I do want to just talk preliminarily what we've seen for some fawn survival. Um, this is 11-month fawn survival, so it's pretty close to annual. Um, you can see we've seen some variation across the state. 
These are two mule deer study areas, one in Region 1, one in Region 2, so Western South Dakota, Central South Dakota, um, and then two whitetail study areas, one in the Southeast and one in the, in the Northeast. So quite a bit of variation. Be really interesting to see how this, this changes over time if it does. So looking forward to um, uh, more, get, gather more data on our fawn survival. Um, so we have all this management data that we look at. We have the research data we look at. And there are some other things we also consider when we try and develop our recommendations for the commission. And one of the things, of course, is public input. Um, all the regions have uh, a variety of open houses every year. They have a regional citizen advisory panels. They get public input. Of course, landowner contacts and hunter contacts. And we get phone calls and emails and, and, and lots of contacts from the public that we consider when we make our recommendations. And then a little more formally is we have public opinion surveys and, and Cindy Longmire, um, who heads up our Human Dimensions program, um, is just about done with uh, the report of the, the public opinion survey we did um, regarding uh, uh, deer species and, and uh, landowners here in 2012. Um, but I got just a couple of graphs I want to share with you. Um, this is looking at white-tailed deer, you know, she asked, uh, um, you know, what percent of landowners had white-tailed deer. Almost all of them had white-tailed deer on their property. Um, but more importantly, the, the landowner's perception on white-tailed deer populations, and this is in 2012, about half the landowners felt their white-tailed deer population was just about right, which is kind of interesting. Another quarter of the landowner population felt like there were, there were too few of white-tailed deer, and another quarter felt there were too many, so pretty evenly split, that, split there. Now looking at mule deer, um, of course, only about 25% of the landowner reported having mule deer present on their, on their, on their um, land. Um, but a much clearer picture on landowners' perception of mule deer. Um, we were at about 40% uh, of landowners felt that their mule deer population was about right, but about 50% felt that mule deer were too few on their property. Um, and then, you know, there were only about, I think it was about 13% that said uh, uh, there were too many or too many deer, so they were definitely the minority in that in that survey. So those are some data we look at there as far as landowner perceptions. Of course, habitat loss is definitely something we need to consider as we move forward with deer management in the state. I, I know you folks have heard a lot on some of the significant habitat losses in the state through grassland losses and, and wetland losses, and and how that's um, uh, impacted our pheasant population. And and I, I just want to reiterate that of course it's going to impact some of our upland game bird species but it's also significant to our our big game population and and it's going to impact our, our deer deer as well not only what we can grow um, now but what we can grow in, in the future um, we've also seen a loss of wetlands with the loss of grass um, with the, with the loss of grasslands in addition with the high commodity prices we've seen a lot of shelter belts end up like this and those shelter belts are important um, in a lot of parts of our state for not only hiding cover, but thermal cover. And, and this is really going to impact, um, impact deer management biologically. Um, but just as important is it's going to impact, uh, it's going to have social impacts on how we manage for deer in the, in the future. Um, you know, a landscape full of uh, grass and trees, socially we can manage for a lot more deer and biologically we can, but a landscape full of just corn and soybeans, you know, socially we're going to have to manage for fewer deer, so that's going to impact uh, some of our future population goals. Uh, weather can also play a, a significant role in our deer populations, um, either through severe winters or, or drought. Um, we, do, um, we do look at severe winters through a WSI index. That's a winter severity index. Uh, we didn't come up with this. Um, there's a study in BC and there's some other studies too and other states are also looking at a way to try and quantify winter severity and, and how that might impact some of their management. Um, so what we're doing is quantifying uh, WSI from November through April. Um, this is the actual formula we're using. But this formula looks at snowfall and, and, uh, and, and temperature. That's, that's the primary factors of the index. What it does is it accumulates uh, a monthly and then a six-month WSI value from November to April. Um, so you have an area or a unit or a year with, with a low WSI value. That means we have a milder winter, has less snow, uh, milder temperatures. It's going to be easier on, on our, on our deer, deer population. So um, we, we're just kind of diving into this here recently, but uh, we've got some data that's pretty interesting to look at. These are WSI values, and I know you can't read them, but that's not important, but what's important is, is the general um, shading of these areas. The darker the area, 
the higher the WSI value. So, um, you know, the central here's hills, northern hills, receives a lot of snow, so it highlights out as, as a pretty high um, WSI value in most years. Um, but you can see here, and this is 2011-12, um, pretty, pretty moderate uh, um, WSI values across the state. Go to 2012 and 13. We have a way here of quantifying. We did have a pretty significant winter in the northeast part of the state. Um, we definitely saw a, a much harder winter on the deer population there. And then what, how we look in this year, um, this year compared to last year in the northeast part of the state, not as bad. Maybe a little more severe down here on the far eastern edge and, and maybe a little bit more up in the, in the northwest than what we've seen the last couple of years. Um, but all in all, not bad. You know, another way to look at this is, is we, value, we uh, calculated a... Uh, um, an average WSI value for the state. So this is a 30-year average um, that, that's gathered from uh, NOAA Weather Station data. A 30-year average using that formula is about 150. So, you know, we, we always kind of felt or knew that in 2009, 10, and 11, we had some severe winters, but now we have a way to quantify how severe those were, and they really, they really show up here. They were definitely above average. And then that's a statewide, and we've also broken it out in these DAUs that I've talked about, which is really going to be important as we move forward and gather more data on our deer and what this means to, to deer survival. But you can see here again these three years pop out in, in DAU 1, which is the northwest, and DAU 6, which is the northeast. But when you look at these values, yeah, they're both above normal for, the, for that area, but this is a little over 250 in 2011. In the northeast, we were almost a 400, so that was a really significant winter on, on those, those deer populations, and that, that um, surely affected some overwinter mortality. In fact, some of the research that we've done here in the last few years, both on mule deer in the Fort Pierre National Grasslands and up on um, Whitetail in Clark County, we've seen a significant, or we've seen a definite correlation between WSI values, which are these bars, and overwinter mortality or losses, which, are, which is these lines. When that WSI goes up, we see higher winter losses of our radio collar deer. So there's definitely some correlation there. We have a lot more work to do to try and fit what that direct relationship is, what that exact value means, but it's something we need to continue to move forward with, gather data on so we can better quantify the impacts of, 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 of what we need to do for, for management of deer. Another thing we look at is predators and deer. Of course, predation is always a hot topic. Um, you know, without, without a doubt, uh, predators can impact populations, especially when you have low ungulate, ungulate populations. You have high predator populations. You can have an impact. We've seen some low fawn survival, some low calf survival in some of our areas in some years, without a doubt. Um, but it's important to note it's, it's not always that simple. And, and the impacts are variable. You know, like I mentioned, if your prey population is low and your predator population is high, that's you're a lot more potential there to impact your, your, your prey. But when you have a high prey population like we did here five years ago, we had a lot of deer. It didn't matter what the coyotes ate. They couldn't eat enough because we were recruiting so many deer into the population. Um, but now we're in a different situation. So we can see effects um, by um, predator and prey population. We can see effects by year, area, habitat, some habitats. Predators are more efficient. Um, the effects of predation also vary by what we have for alternate prey out there, um, whether it's other ungulate species or um, rabbits and, and what have you. And also there's been research out there that has shown the effects of predation can, can vary significantly based on the nutritional condition of the prey. So, so for example, deer in, in better nutritional condition actually can have lower predation rates in some areas. So a lot of variability out there, but it is something we need to um, talk about and consider and, and acknowledge in some situations that it may affect our management. And one more thing I want to talk about is disease. Um, we've, we've mentioned this before, um, epizootic hemorrhagic disease or EHD or um, blue tongue virus combined, those are hemorrhagic diseases. Um, we have seen an increase in, in the reports from those these last few years um, to the point where um, it has affected what we do for management. Um, this is 2012 reports. We had about 3,700 reports, which was a record for us. You can see the location of of these reports, the southeast got hit really hard, an area we didn't necessarily need to get hit. Um, this last year, the good news is we only had about 850 reports. Um, locations kind of changed, some different areas were hit. Um, we did see um, some more um, blue tongue um, virus than, than we have in the past. 
which tends to affect pronghorn more. So we did see some pronghorn loss, um, although probably not significant, but we did get some reports. And then we did lose, document a few elk died with the, um, for MEHD. So this is what, uh, just looking at the last few years where we've had some consistent data. Obviously 2012 was a, was a big year for us for EHD losses. Um, because last year uh, we, we still, still did see some losses. Um, we did, um, the department in cooperation with the, with the commission did offer some, some refunds and pulled some licenses, um, some own sold licenses. Uh, we offered refunds in, in four counties um, that were West River and we pulled some licenses in two West River counties and one East River County. Not real significant numbers, but um, we did try to minimize the impact that, that we might see in those areas. So just to sum up some of that data I just talked about um, and kind of prepare for our recommendation here, you know, what, what we're seeing is some record low harvest success and that concerns us. Um, we've seen some possible declining um, rates in our recruitment um, estimates and, and that's concerning. We've had a lot of negative hunter comments, a lot of even some negative landowner comments which um, we haven't had in quite a while. Um, landowner opinion survey um, tend to uh, you know definitely weighed more heavily towards landowner wanting more deer. Um, we've seen some landscape uh, level losses of our habitat and that, that's an issue and a concern. Um, we're coming off some severe winters which we did see some some above average uh, winter losses in at least the radio collar deer that we had and we assume in some other areas too. Um, we actually, I didn't talk about this, but we had a record drought in 2012 which probably didn't impact our whitetails too much, we'd, we'd theorize at least, um, but, but drought does and, and has been shown to impact uh, mule deer and pronghorn in some, some of the more uh, um, dry areas of the state, so that's, that's a concern. And then we had record EHD losses in 2013 and some of our research shows some pretty low survival in some areas. So um, with that, all those data we've pulled together to try and decide where, where do we want to go as far as management objectives. Uh, and, and for mule deer, uh, the picture is pretty clear. Um, this is pretty much where we manage for mule deer. In all of our areas, for the most part, we either want to substantially increase, which is blue, or we're looking at slight increase here on more on the, on the edge there which is the light blue. So we're really trying to ramp up our, um, our mule deer populations as much as possible. Um, White-tailed deer, not quite as clear of a picture, but again, there's a lot of blue on this map. And again, dark blue means substantial increase. That's our objective for the, um, pretty much the entire southeast part of the state. And then you can see a few other areas we're wanting a substantial increase. We have a few areas where we're, we're still okay with where we're at as far as white tail numbers go. Um, some areas we were um, fighting depredation for a long time. Um, took us a long time to get on top of that population. Um, we're not sure we're quite to the point where we want to say we want to increase it. So um, we're, we're maintaining where we're where we're at right now in those areas. So this leads up to our recommendations for East River deer. Um, we're recommending uh, um, some pretty substantial decreases overall. A 21 percent decrease in license numbers a 40 percent decrease in tag numbers from last year that would be our recommendation to the commission uh, for west river deer very similar we're recommending a 22 percent decrease in license numbers overall 57 percent decrease in the tag numbers um, from what we had last year um, you combine the two we're looking at where our recommendations are are over 40,000 less deer tags across the state for those two seasons uh, Black Hills, um, we're, we're recommending status quo for the most part. Um, like we mentioned in some of our data, where our success is pretty good there. Um, we might be coming out of the, out of the hole there yet. Uh, that's still, still to be determined, um, but uh, we don't think we need to change anything right now. Uh, and other than we did remove uh, the last of those antlerless licenses that were available, we removed the last hundred, so there are no antlerless only. Well, analyst of specific licenses in the hills. Archery muzzleloader youth, um, we did add a, a bunch of counties or, or management units to the restricted area and we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, we're also recommending to change um, all those uh, muzzleloader and archery season any antlerless licenses. We're recommending the commission change those to any whitetail antlerless licenses so there would be no more um, uh, archery or muzzleloader any antlerless or, um, type of license. Um, this is our, 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 some of the zone management options we have when we look at making our recommendations to the commission. And I know we've talked about this 
um, briefly before, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but I do want to outline a few things here real quick. Um, this kind of guides some of our management philosophy and our recommendations, and we're basing it on our population objective here. So here we have our objective, either to decrease, maintain, or increase the population. And once we determine what that objective is, we look at liberal harvest, moderate harvest, or restrictive type of harvest scenarios. So in those scenarios, we have options to pick from firearm license numbers, obviously, license types, um, and these are both unit specific. And then we have um, a late season, which we don't really mess with other than by rule. The late season is closed if we don't have any antlers licenses. Um, so if, if we're to the point of being restrictive, we, we do remove, uh, in, in essence, that uh, season, that late season for, for firearm hunters. Um, but then we have these statewide seasons. Um, depending on what our, our goal is, um, there are different restrictions on them in the different in the different scenarios there and not only our statewide but also our landowner free licenses are affected based on what our our management goal is for those units so this year all of our our um, deer units are either in the restrictive harvest zone or the moderate harvest there is no liberal harvest this year and that's a significant change from where we were last year so how is that going to impact what what hunters folks what hunters um, see uh, in our applications and, and what folks have to use to, to manage for or, or to harvest deer. So here, here's, the, here's the impacts of that. Um, basically, um, all these hashed out areas for our muzzleloader antlers and our archery antlers, these are closed to antlers harvest. Um, so the only places that those statewide licenses will be eligible will be those, those white areas. Um, youth will only be eligible for one license this year it will be a statewide licenses but they will not be able to pick up another one um, one note on our free landowner licenses um, as, as some of you may recall a, uh, a couple years ago um, this option was um, um, brought up in our uh, legislature and a law was passed to allow for free landowner licenses um, the legislature gave the commission the authority to dictate on how those licenses um, would be issued and the commission promulgated rules here a couple years ago on how to do that. And, and this is a, a excerpt of the rule. But basically you had to have, in order to have a, a unit eligible for free landowner licenses, um, you had to have leftovers after the second draw. So if you were selling out of all of your antlers licenses in the first or second draw, then we would not offer free landowner licenses in that unit. Also, in that rule, there would be no free landowner licenses in areas where archery or muzzleloader antlers licenses was restricted. And as I just went over, you could see in those uh, management zones, the whole state is restricted this, this year. So um, uh, following this rule and following our recommendation, there would be no free landowner licenses available. Um, just to give you an idea of last year what we had for license sales, about 1,400 licenses not really sold, they're free licenses, but were issued to landowners and our projected harvest was a little over 400 deer. And the last thing I wanted to talk about here, which is um, kind of some interesting data, a different way to look at, at some of our data and our management of deer, is looking at tag densities. So these are the tag densities, um, overall tag densities in 2013. Um, so here's your, your tags per square mile. Um, you can see we range from almost a half a tag per square mile all the way up to close to two and a half tags per square mile. And these are different DAUs. This was DAU1. I got the map up here so you can reference that. But last year our highest tag densities were in DAU4 and 5, which is where we've had some high deer populations in the central part of the state. Comparing that with our recommended tag densities this year, this is where we'd fall out. Um, you can see every single one of these drops down pretty substantially except for the Black Hills. DAU3 would be the Black Hills. Um, as you can see, um, even the blue here is this year, even though we didn't change much, we still would be one of the highest tag densities of all the DAUs. So this is what the average was in 2013, and our recommended average would be down here this year as far as tag densities, so it's a substantial de decrease. With that, that's uh, all the information I have. Uh, entertain any questions or discussion? Let's run back up there and we'll do that.
questions for uh, Andy? It was a good presentation, Andy. Really good. I know there's a lot of information to absorb there, but we're going to be asked these questions that you anticipated. Appreciate the appreciate the slide, Joel. Gary. So trying to anticipate the questions that we'll get, everybody will get over the next 30 days. What do you think the population is now across the state, maybe East River, West River? What are we trying to get back to? Uh, maybe we should just start there. Well, to sum it up, we, we feel with the changes that we've recommended to you for proposal, we feel that these changes are going to turn around our deer populations in most of our units. Well, we, we recommend the, we're making recommendations to try and change that in all of our units. So um, I think we have a fair amount of confidence that we're going to start to see increasing populations in a lot of our areas with these type of tag changes. Now, depending on how low your population is, that increase may take a while to notice. You know, if you have 100 deer versus 1,000 deer, a little bit of an increase is going to be really hard to notice if you only have 100 deer. So you have to keep that in perspective. It may take a while, especially on mule deer in some of these units. It may take a while with, until we actually start to see a noticeable change. But from a harvest perspective, we're doing everything we can to, to, to have a, you know, a positive rate increase in all of our populations. But it seems like a lot of people are going to want numbers. So do we have a population number of how many deer we think there are? I mean, I understand it's a very difficult question and a very difficult thing to assess, but yep. I anticipate we're going to be asked, what is the deer population? What are the numbers? And, and what do we think they should be? Yep, and every year we, um, we, we produce a... Uh, um, uh, what is that in our harvest, our big game harvest report, um, we produce population estimates. Um, you know, deer is a little different. It's not like pronghorn where we can go out and fly every unit and come up with a, you know, a, a pretty, pretty decent estimate. Not like elk where we can fly, you know, the entire Black Hills and come up with a decent estimate. Um, but we do our best through some of the data that I presented here and some of our population models. So I'll give you an idea um, of what, and, and these will be in our report. Um, <coughs> So last year we reported, um, looking at East River deer, East and West River deer for white-tailed deer, we reported our estimate of about 357,000. Um, this year our estimate, uh, and this is preliminary, crunching some quick numbers here, would be about 317,000. So we estimated the population is still slowly declining with what we had last year. Um, for, the, for the Black Hills, we estimated about 38,000 um, white-tailed deer. Um, this year, we actually estimated about 41,000, so maybe it's coming around. Um, but, you know, I'd put an asterisk on that because we don't have any recent survival data in the Black Hills um, since really pre-Lion data, so a lot of our survival data is outdated. Um, we, we need to do, do some work and get some better survival data in the Black Hills and our deer populations so we can model them a little better. So take that with a grain of salt, but we're probably, you know, around that 40,000 white-tailed deer. Now, for mule deer, our best estimate... Um, Looking at the prairies, last year was about 93,000. This year, about 87,000. So hopefully, we've, we've, uh, we're going to start to turn the, turn the corner here on those. Um, for Black Hills, again, pretty limited data set, so got to be careful here. But um, about 8,300 deer in the Black Hills. Um, we think we're around 9,000. So, but, but again, we don't have any updated survival data, so it's pretty hard to hang your hat on that. But that gives you an idea. Probably got between eight and 9,000. Um, deer in the Black Hills as far as mule deer. We've got some pretty wide confidence intervals on all those estimates and I want to make sure we acknowledge that. Um, for example, our, our estimate on white-tailed deer in the prairie and these confidence intervals are a reflection of the variability in the limited data we have. So the more limited data, the larger your confidence intervals are. Um, you know, we're 95 percent confident our white-tailed deer estimate that was 317,000 is between 220,000 and 414,000. So we got wide confidence intervals, which means we have some highly variable data and some limited data that we're making inferences off of. So we always need to keep that in mind. The more data we have, the more we can narrow that down. But um, we're moving in that direction, but we still got a ways to go. So and then sort of related to that is with the, the decreases that you're proposing, I mean, what number are we trying to get to? <clears throat> what, what's the goal? 
Um, and so maybe instead of 20,000 less, maybe there should be 15,000 less. People are going to want to know why, why those numbers and, and what the difference is if we selected something different. Sure. And, and the numbers we're trying to get to right now are more, I mean, <laughs> in, in a nutshell. I, we, we don't, I don't have a number that we're trying to get to right now. Um, you know, in the future, as we get more data and we're, we have an ability to um, maybe make better estimates at the DAU level, I don't know if we're ever going to get enough data to make really good estimates at the small management unit level, but at the DAU level that we talked about, um, then I think we can start talking about numbers. But right now we're, we're talking about direction and what direction we're trying to go to. And, and hopefully in it, when we start talking about, you know, our deer management planning process, I don't know if we're going to resolve any numbers there, but at least we can talk about how do we come up with a number or a threshold on where we want to be, whether it's hunter success or landowner tolerance or it's a DAU population estimates. I don't know what the magic number is going to be, but there will be a lot of things to consider to try and figure that out. Well, kind of following up on the discussion and the vote we had last month when we did the elk numbers and, and made some changes <clears throat> so if we take east river instead of what would happen if we change the number five thousand one way or another yeah um yeah what is five thousand enough I, I don't know if i can tell you that right now off the top of my head yeah. you know obviously if you remove five thousand more licenses that's going to help get us to our goal of more deer quicker <clears throat> And, and maybe that's a cop out, but that's that's the bottom line. Um, the more licenses we remove, the more imp the more we can reduce the impact of hunter harvest on those deer populations and come around quicker. And there's always a fine line of trying to do that and also still provide some recreational opportunity. Because if you have a deer population out there and you have that ability, you might as well provide some recreational opportunity. And we always have the social impacts to deal with as well as far as landowner tolerance. And most of our units are. Um, are predominantly private land, and you could see in that survey, there's not 100% of landowners saying we want to, we want more deer, mm -hmm. and so we have it's a mixed bag of opinions out there, and we have to keep that in mind too when we try and figure out where we want to go and how fast and how far. Kelly, um, just an observation, um, with this big of a change to make some growth, it's good to see that you don't feel the numbers have dropped by 40%. Or 50% the number of deer, but in order to get the growth back, to get the opportunity back, the recommended change is to change the license or the tags by that amount in order to again make some good hunting opportunities without drastic losses continuing. Yeah. So. Jim? Um, I had <clears throat> two phone calls on the way out here <clears throat> today and uh, I think uh, the, p the people that have talked to me are excited that we're really addressing uh, not shooting uh, the does. I mean, we're lowering that. They like that. Yeah. But it keeps coming up <clears throat> that January season, and there's a lot of people hung up on that just for discussion. But that two-week season at the end is something they talk about, too. Thank you. And I'll just add a couple of comments if I could. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I mean, you could see that in our in our hunter comments as well, and and we definitely hear um, hear from that from our our publics. I, I know the um, staff in in particular in the eastern part of the state uh, really hear a lot of comments on that. You know, our our approach so far has has been that. Um, you know, until we get to that, uh, you know, when, when we go to that restrictive zone, it does close that season by design of license types um, because we're out for no antlerless licenses, so there will be no harvest. Um, but, you know, our approach has been we can estimate what the harvest is in that season. Um, there are some areas that can still withstand that, so we can manage for that still in our license numbers. And, and that, that's uh, obviously popular with some because some people do participate in that and enjoy that opportunity, and we hear from those folks as well. Um, but there are folks that, that, that have a hard time grasping that, you know, um, how, how can we kill deer in that late season when we want more deer? And, and it, you know, the bottom line is we're trying to account for that number when we make a recommendation to you on how many licenses we have. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, go ahead. If I may comment on that, uh, <clears throat> my phone calls, the number one issue is the January season. 
the local people that call me and ask me why in the world do we have a January season. And I think it's more landowner tolerance than biology. The landowners have youth season, muzzleloader season, rifle season, archery season. And by the 1st of December, they think it's over. And here in January comes along another week of deer season. It's a landowner tolerance issue as well as a, a biological issue. So let's address that too if we, if we could. Yeah, and I would just second that. I mean, definitely our folks in the western, <clears throat> in the western part of the state, um, particular region one, um, they hear a lot from their landowners about too long a seasons. And just like you mentioned, it's a it's a social issue there with um, with the number of hunters. You know, it wasn't too long ago we did have seasons that went all the way to January 31, archery, muzzleloader, and youth, and we did you know taper those back. Um, but yeah, this uh, this uh, season extension is is still um, still an issue to folks. Maybe real quickly, in relation to Scott's question, the the issue for quite a few years is the fact that we had so many deer that we were doing as much as we could with the antlerless deer <coughs> tags, including the late season, in order to address the depredation complaints that everybody right. uh, was was having to suffer through. I can remember. Mike and I can remember Arden and I can remember uh, Scott now talking about the issues in, in regards to yarded deer numbering in the hundreds, in some cases the five and six hundreds. Yep. So we, in essence, did everything we could to have hunting become the management tool that we, as opposed to say putting a depredation hunt up and drawing people to go out and shoot them off the haystacks, et cetera, which is distasteful to a lot of people. So in this particular case, what we've in essence done, and it, it's, it's hard for folks in a state to understand, um, much the same as our elk harvest to decrease numbers of elk, people had a, a certain uh, privilege, I guess you would say, over a long period of time to be able to have lots of deer tags and to hunt for a long period of time to bring these numbers down. So the issue of us now addressing a 40% cut in licenses or 50%, 57% cut in licenses are based upon the fact that we were damn successful. I mean, that's one, that's an issue. We have to, we have to face that in addition to EHD and in addition to the, to the issues with drought and some of the other things that have come along over the last few years to decrease those numbers. And that, and that's hard to get across that that's almost like, uh, well, what the hell happened? You know, what happened? Like something happened. Well, that, what happened was that nature happened, and so did we. So did the harvest people. So did the folks that are involved with carrying the rifles. Uh, in the issue with Scott's concern, we would still have the option of a depredation hunt if, in fact, um, some of the folks that are in your area end up with yarded deer and problems in regards to haystack and, and depredation, right? Yep. So, so this is that... This is that kind of the thing of splitting the baby to try to figure out how far you can go to keep hunting as your management tool. In order to do that, to cut down on those yarded deer, that's the, that's the reason for going that late season. And I know that's hard to, for landowners to, to get, but that's what happens. Wouldn't it be just as effective to add a week onto the end of the regular season like has been done in the past? Regular rifle season gets over, over on a Sunday and the next week is antlerless season instead of waiting a month to have it in January, though? Yeah, I may be mistaken. You jump in here, Chad, but I think the idea of that was to relate, re, try to use hunting to apply to that situation where the deer populations are most likely to yard and most likely to, to address the, the um, and that's when it happens, is that dead tough winter that period of time later on when those deer are hanging around the yards sure. um, and then we need to recognize we have another uh, user group out there the muzzleloader deer hunters uh, that essentially are just stuck right now with the month of December and that's that's their opportunity to hunt uh, solely so uh, not not that that's a a main reason to to not bring that back uh, you know another tool that we took away was uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, harvest antlerless deer during the uh, uh, firearm uh, pronghorn season. 
uh, that, that's a tool we took away here a couple years ago in response to to this as well so I I think and I, I certainly know where uh, Scott's coming from and I, I I know that that landowner tolerance issue is certainly out there but so is also so is the problem with depredation on a really tough winter if in fact that particular person has a big yard of deer and it's hard to manage uh, ha not being able to have deer completely spread out in equal numbers over certain locations they're just in they're just where they're going to be in some places are traditionally a tough place to, to not to not have that late season as a and I recognize Jim I get the same pressures but on the other side of the coin I think you got to somehow an incremental one of the things that Andy's uh, presentation I think really hit on and that is um, you, <clears throat> you you either are managing to decrease deer or it seems like you're managing to increase deer very rarely have I ever seen it in my career we're just happier than hell with this number <laughs> never it never is there we'd like to get there yeah well we hope we get there but but I but don't know what that number is because the tolerance issues keep changing so anyway I I'm through philosophizing but I I guess my feelings are you guys have done about as much as you possibly can do with the the cards that are that are being dealt here right now where we're at it's a different time than it was eight years ten years ago totally different so the secretary the one other brief social comment about that late season I since I've been here um, I can tell you we've gotten a lot of input from folks who have college kids that come home over the holiday season and and, uh, and, and in fact I'd say I don't know if I'd call it pressure but a lot of input about you know, my kid comes home, this is his time to be able to hunt, and he can't hunt. And so it really worked well, uh, given where we were with the deer herd, to, to have that, that doe season, because it did provide that, that individual the opportunity to hunt on the home ranch or the home farm uh, when he was on, or she was on break from college. So just a lot of, it's just another factor. So it's a social factor. Um, but but we did get that input a fair amount. May I respond to that, please? Uh, I I kind of assumed that was one of the reasons for that. On the other side of that coin, I had a, a conversation with a lady that said, you know, the Game Fish and Parks has uh, made it necessary for us to stay home on Thanksgiving as a rancher because he wants to protect his property from trespassers, and then we have the season starting again on December 27th. Now that's not Christmas, but it's pretty close, so it. It cuts off uh, Christmas vacations for some of the people that feel they need to stay home and protect their property from, from trespassers. So, yeah, the kids are home on Christmas break, but also maybe their rancher would like to, to be gone. And uh, there's another deer season coming along. So there's obviously two sides to every issue. Other questions? Other questions? Concerns? Anybody? Okay. Yeah, the, we're going to talk about the, the individuals. <coughs> Thank you, Andy. Well done. Appreciate the effort you put into that. You want to hop so, into deer proposals? Then? Let's go. Let's go okay. through.